Um, <clears throat> so go ahead, everybody. Uh, yes, like Shiva said, I'm Daryl Brown. And uh, I guess uh, I actually went to junior prep school first. So I, I went to prep school starting in fifth grade. So uh, I guess I could just, just give you a little bit of background on that before I uh, get into that specifically. So uh, when, I was, when I was a child, uh, you know, I think from like first to, uh, first to fourth grade, uh, and, yeah, and before that in kindergarten as well, I was, uh, I was just bad. I mean, uh, I didn't listen to teachers. I didn't listen to my mom. I didn't listen to anyone. I mean, for my friends uh, at the back, I mean, this, this will make my life make even more sense. Um, but but um, yeah, so, I, mean, I got into lots of trouble at school. And, uh, but the, the, uh, the issue that compounded that was, was that I was pretty much I was smarter than you know, all of my classmates. And um, for, for a period of time, I was also smarter than um, some of my teachers. So this, you know, all of these factors just, you know, combined together, the, together to make me a huge jerk, just a complete and total jerk. And, uh, you know, eventually people started retaliating against me. So, you know, uh, the kids in school who I was smarter than, or, you know, I would just yeah, get right answers in class. And they'd come up to me after lunch and be like, hey, Daryl. Like, oh, hey, what's up, guys? How's it going? Tell me a joke. Um, and if I didn't have one, you know, they just, uh, they'd, uh, they'd rough me up a bit. So, um, eventually, you know, I just, I just learned to get, to get funny fast, um, <laughs> real fast. Um, but then, you know, uh, that wasn't enough. They, they started, uh, you know, getting mad about me getting answers right in class when they got them wrong. So, you know, uh, at one point they were like, yeah, you know, just, uh, j just, just don't answer any questions in class. So I was like, okay. So, you know, uh, in school, my teachers, you know, they'd ask a question, you know, oh, what's uh, four times eight, you know, and nobody would know, and, you know, she'd be like, well, Daryl, Daryl, why don't you answer? Uh, I don't know, I'm not really sure, 31, 33, and, um, you know, I mean, you can imagine how all of this combined to be a very uh, unproductive school environment for me. So, uh, my mom uh, started looking for, uh, for private school options for me. And uh, you know the the school she settled on was it's called the Pheasant School. It's in Newton. It's a uh, it's a junior prep school as I mentioned earlier, uh, which means that it's a uh, it's a boarding school designed to get kids into you know uh, other New England boarding schools essentially, also you know uh, Mid Atlantic New Jersey, etc. Um, so that was really the the sort of mindset of of my junior prep school. So when I went there in fifth grade, um, I was just uh, just overwhelmed. I mean it was just. Um, the, the campus was beautiful, I mean, everybody was so cool and so nice and so rich, and um, it, was, it, was a, it, was a, it was a big change for me, but one of the nice things about going to Fezzeted was, uh, was that when people found out I was from Brockton, um, which is where I was living at the time, which uh, I think uh, around that time, I think it had like, I don't know, like the fourth highest murder rate in the country or something, or I don't know, like the fourth most dangerous city, something to that effect. So, you know, kids uh, went home, because I, I was the new kid, you know, uh, there, were, uh, there were three new black kids, and uh, the, other two were, the other two were from Newton and Wellesley, so, you know, pretty upscale places. I was from Brockton, so, you know, all the kids went home, and they're like, oh, mom, dad, this kid goes to Brockton, you know. They came in the next day, and they were like, yeah, so, Daryl, like, have you ever c committed armed robbery? <laughs> and I was like, well, yeah, like, <laughs> sure, like, I, I, I was so hood there, man, I, you know, I just... You know, I shook people down, uh, took their lunch money, and, um, you know, that, that <laughs> and, you know, of course, I didn't do any of those things. I mean, it was the exact opposite. But, um, you know, that was the sort of, uh, that was just the sort of what just happened to me at Fezzeted. So um, I went through, uh, my experience, my prep school experience, I would say, was, was very different from, uh, from Andre's in the film. I mean, um, I didn't have any, so I never felt, um, I never felt poor at my, at my prep school. I mean, we had, uh, we had uniforms, so, like, everyone had, everyone wore the same exact Clothing, you know, uh, same same shoes and whatnot. So, I mean, it was uh, during the school day. You, you know, you didn't notice any discrepancies. And then, uh, you know, the school gave us all our books. So that was an issue. And all the weekends, you know, they just they gave me money. They gave me money because I was on financial aid to like buy dinner and stuff. So, I mean, it was really. Uh, it, was, it was. I mean, it was. Uh, it was probably one of the greatest experiences that I've ever had. And also, I mean, it was pretty. It was. It was about as egalitarian as it could be given the circumstances. So uh, I think that uh, you know, just in terms of. Where I, where I began, uh, you know, the circumstances uh, upon which I, I started going to prep school really just uh, combined to make it a really great experience for me. And I think, um, you know, just in terms of uh, overall, you know, what do we make of private school versus prep school versus boarding school? I think it's always important, you know, to just be at a place that you want to be in, you know, and so I, I definitely wanted to be at Pheasant. I wanted to go to private school. I wanted to, uh, you know, get a better education. So it was, uh, it was, a, it was a great for me, but, uh, you know, it was only really because I was there, I wanted to do it, 
Ed, uh, you know, because people thought I was, you know, really gangster when I wasn't, so they didn't uh, mess with me and whatnot. And um, yeah, I guess that's it. <laughs> All right, um, I'm Ernest Higginbotham. Uh, I went to private school in Wilmington, Delaware, called Wilmington Friends School. It's very similar to Germantown Friends, just in Delaware. Um, and my experience started when I was like four. Like this school goes from pre-kindergarten to 12, and I went there from pre-kindergarten to 12. And <laughs> um, super lifer, super right? And for most of my time there, I was the only black kid in my class, like whether it be the classroom or like the class, like the 50 people that were in my grade that I went up the, the years with. And um, it became just like a natural place for me. I, I, I never felt like, you know, alienated or anything through, you know, pre-K, first grade, second grade, all the way until high school. Um, and then things changed because when I was in fourth grade, I moved to more of the city of Wilmington. So I was surrounded by more black people and more like non-white people rather than like where I lived in before. I lived in Landenburg, PA, which is a pretty affluent area. And um, you know, I didn't really interact with any of my neighbors. So I wasn't really concerned with who was around me. And it was just the white people at school. And then you know, I started hanging out with the people in the neighborhood, and, and you know, they were predominantly black, a couple of Latin kids, but no white kids. And the contrast between coming home every day and going to the park and playing ball, and then having to leave early because I had homework. And like, where are you leaving? Like, what are you doing? And, and, and I had to explain to them that I have to do work for tomorrow, and it's going to take me a few hours. And, and then the divide, the divide started when I was at home because I couldn't hang out with my friends. And then I realized that, you know, I got to high school and I realized that I wasn't like everyone else. Like, there were, I don't know what it was, but I feel like there was this moment where it became clear to me that, you know, there's something that I'm not. And, and I started observing different things and different, different ways people acted towards me that I ne didn't necessarily, like, notice before. And perhaps, like, that's because everyone's growing up, everyone's becoming more aware. And, and their interactions with me changed like drastically to the point where I felt alienated at home because, you know, I was the white, the white black guy who went to private school and I went, I was alienated at school because I was the black guy and, and no one else was. And so through my freshman and sophomore years, I looked for someone, there were other like black kids in the grades above me and I looked to them for guidance as in like, you know, you've gone through this too, like help me out. Like what, like what do I do? How do I handle this? And it was just hard because they weren't responsive. And like, what do I do? So it was, it was just a dark two years because, you know, like I, I have to figure out how to do this because, you know, I have a little brother who's, he's 18. He's actually going to Con College. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> and and he's he's one year younger than I am, but he's two years removed from me in school. So he's a senior now. I'm a sophomore here. Um, so I'm going through these years. Like I got to figure this out, man. I don't want my brother to go through this. And then once I got to be a junior, I realized that, you know, no one was going to do that for me. I had to do it myself. So the non-existent Black Student Union in my school started because I made it. And. And through that, I found connections with the other, the other like black kids in my school, and they became a support group. And then, you know, the first meeting was really awkward because you know we had all these uh, other kids who were coming in to be black because they thought it was funny to like join the Black Student Union. But once we got past that, and once we got past like the initial like backlash, like why do you need to have a Black Student Union? You know, it was really it was really powerful because I felt I felt myself like taking claim. Of, of the loneliness and the alienation that, that had, like, had plagued me for the past two years. And I started to control it and put it away. And I felt as if I was doing that, you know, for everyone else who felt the same way. You know, the other black kids in my class at the time and, and the classes below me and my brother as well, it turns out they all felt the same way. <laughs> 
and everyone was looking for someone to like share it with. Um, so you know, by my junior and senior year, I took I, I made a like a concerted effort to 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 take you know the the new the kids who were new to the school Wilmington Friends or new to high school who had been through middle school and stuff to take them you know not under my wing but like let them know that I was there like let them know that like you know I know what you're going through to some extent you know not everyone's experience is the same but um, just to be there and and it turns out that, that they wanted that and like I became the person that I was looking for. And that's just so rewarding. There's nothing better than, than like, you know, wanting something, not getting it, but being able to provide so like that thing to someone else who, who probably wanted it as much as you. And like, you know what it feels like to like want things, like you want this, you want someone to be that for you. And to relieve that pain, relieve that stress, to have them not feel plagued by the alienation was is is incredible. So like, you know, in my senior year, I don't know if Andre remembers me, but he came to Wilmington Friends School. Um, you know, he came and there was a screening, an optional one, for for faculty, parents, students who wanted to go. And me and a few of my friends went. We watched his movie. We were inspired. We sat outside. Man, it was so cold. We spilled orange juice and it froze on the pavement. Like we sat outside and talked there for two hours, three hours after the movie about our experiences, and we thought, you know, we have to get, like, everyone has to see this. And they did. He came the spring of that year, and uh, the movie was screened, the same one you guys saw. And on the Facebook page, I became a fan of it, and I watched that night all of my friends write words that, like, you know, not, not just my black friends, but my white friends and, you know, my Asian friends, like, write, write words that, that described how I felt and described how they were beginning to understand, like, this has changed my life, you know, I, I'll never do these things again, like, I haven't thought about this. And, and so, I, I like to think that, like, my prep school experience didn't start till high school because that's when the issue started, but also <laughs> because, <laughs> um, <laughs> but also because, like, I like to think my, my prep school experience was marked by like, you know, a plague and then, you know, a cure and then being that cure for the plague. And I don't know. I like I love my I love my high school. I wanted to leave, but I'm glad I didn't because it turns out to be like, you know, it it it, it allowed me to be the leader and like have leadership skills and, and, and like mentoring ability that, that you don't just get. Like you you have to do things, you have to interact with people to, to learn to learn like how to help them, how to be there for them without imposing yourself. And I don't know, I'm glad I stayed. I'm glad I went. And that's just my experience. Um, my name is Jessica. I'm a senior now and I went to boarding school at St. Andrews in Middletown, Delaware, which is quite far from home, um, which is in the Bronx. And uh, before I continue, I'm also wondering how many people went to prep school. Don't be shy, it's okay. <laughs> oh, okay, so we're the minority. <laughs> um, don't worry, I won't give us a bad rap. Um, but so I came up um, through Prep for Prep, which is this program in New York City um, for like gifted minority students. That was like the big phrase when um, we were all in middle school and um, you know, it's like, you have potential, you're a really gifted minority, like, you have talent. I was like, well, what does that mean? Like, what does this talent look like? What can I do with it? And um, I was really excited, like, sick, you know, I've got something. Um, and so I was a really eager kid. I come up to Prep for Prep, and um, my middle school in the Bronx was um, on the border between a really uh, ethnically diverse area. There are a lot of uh, Eastern Europeans near where I live, but also a lot of Dominicans. And then up in Riverdale, which is like the richer, like bougie part of the Bronx, um, was like a ton of like Jews and Korean communities. And so um, it was like, well, I've never been up here before. And so I get to middle school and um, all of my classmates were either white, uh, mostly Jewish or Korean. And so I'm sitting here like, okay, cool. Um, I'm not sharing lunch with anyone. Like, what am I gonna do now? Um, and so I, I got into prep for prep and 
I had to balance existing in these two different um, environments. One was a totally black environment where I was a minority again, but except I was um, Latina. And so I couldn't really connect totally with my black classmates who were all from like Brooklyn and like had this very like strong West Indian heritage. And I'm over here like, okay, cool. I can't whine. I can't do this. Like I'm chill over here. <laughs> and so <laughs> my friends were like, Jess, we're going to teach you these things. And I was like, cool. And so I'm getting to boarding school and uh, my, my family drops me off. And on the first day, I remember being absolutely terrified of the people on my hall. They were all so excited, and um, I thought that they all knew each other, but it turns out um, my 14-year-old mind was like, maybe white people are excited like this all the time. <laughs> and so I was like, well, I don't know how I'm going to deal with this. And my RL, our residential leader, which is kind of like a JA, uh, she was this, she was also Hispanic and she was from the Bronx. And so I was like, well, thank God. I was like, Natalie. And I took her aside and I go... Natalie, like, I don't, I don't know how to talk to them. And she said, it's okay, Jess. Like, they're friendly. They're fine. And I was like, all right, like, help me navigate this. Because everyone was so enthusiastic. And I was just not used to that energy level at all. Um, my roommate was this great girl. Um, she rode crew. Um, she was just about as much of an opposite for me as you could imagine. Um, she was from, like, Chevy Chase, Maryland. Uh, she came in rowing crew. Her family was very well off. I've come, I come from a pretty, like, low socioeconomic background, and so I didn't know how to relate. And that was one of the scariest things for me, because here I was being dropped off for the next four years of my life in this environment that nobody had really prepared me for. Um, and in a lot of ways, Prep for Prep did try to prepare us for the culture shock, but it is just so unfathomable how different you feel in environments like that without any real like coaching um, and so I was thinking all right well what are things I'm comfortable with um, and so immediately like in the excitement of the of the first day um, all the girls are like in the hallway and our RL tells us we have to get ready for the square dance and I was like square dance like what are you, what are you serious and so I find out that this is like a big tradition at St. Andrews for it's their equivalent of first days um, and you go to the square dance and everyone dresses up and like puts on freckles and like braids and all of these things and so I get to the square dance and I'm looking around and people have their like sports bras and like short shorts on and stuff and I was like everyone's naked I'm so out of place like maybe I can tie my shirt up and fit in and so I was like cool um and so these were like I was so overwhelmed um and the overwhelmed feeling continued well into um basketball season and so basketball season comes around and like I try out and I make the varsity squad and I was like sick cool like I know this stuff like I could totally do basketball um and there's this one moment, uh, my coach was black, um, and so I was like, maybe, you know, he'll like, like this can be a, a connection for me because I, at this point I was still trying to navigate what it means to be different in this space and like how much of my um, otherness I would bring to conversations and relationships with people that I just met at St. Andrews. Um, and so there was one day our coach was gone and the assistant coach, she had graduated from... Um, from a really white institution too. Um, she played lacrosse in college. She was great, but she goes, um, so we have like these reversible pennies and they were red and white, our school colors. And she's trying to separate us for this drill. And she goes, all right, my white people over here. And everyone looks at me and is like, uh. <laughs> and she goes, no, that's not what I meant. And like everyone on the team is just like, she can't say that. I can't believe she called this white. Like Jess is the only brown one. And it was really uncomfortable. Um, and I kept feeling this um, otherness when we would go to other schools. And there was one time during the season where we went to play a public school. And Middletown High School hated St. Andrews. Like, when we were out in town, they would throw bottles at people and be like, like, they would just say nasty things about us because they had this conception of us as this prep school that was just in town for a few years. And we were these bougie kids that, like, had nothing to do with the community. Um, so we go to Middletown, and this is my first time, like, in Middletown, Delaware, and we will go into the gym, and, like, everyone's brown, like, every face in the crowd, and my teammates were terrified, and we were in the locker room, and they were talking about, uh, they're like, I don't know how we're going to play defense, like, I don't know how to play like this, and I was like, well, what are they really saying? And I felt so uncomfortable again with the fact that, um, 
my teammates were scared of this black team we were about to play. And I was so frustrated because to me, it was like, well, it doesn't matter what color they are. Like, they, they don't have to be black to be better than us. Like, it might be a different style of basketball than, you know, what some prep schools are used to playing. But I was just so confused and so anxious about this. Like, well, you know, I'm not going to get any burn anyway, so I can't really help. And so I was just like, I guess I'll sit here. Um, and so I really struggled with how vocal to become during my time in prep school because I didn't want to be the token student. I didn't want to be the token like Spanish girl in class that was talking about, you know, like eating platanos and like all of this stuff um, because it was so easy to become tokenized in these environments where a lot of my classmates weren't exposed to students like me before um, and also just didn't have, didn't have the opportunity to develop genuine relationships with different kids outside of their socioeconomic class or wherever they're from regionally. Um, and so as I got older, I started thinking about how visible my brownness made me in this space. And it really came to a head um, when I started dating this boy. He was um, like the whitest boy I could ever imagine. He was from Santa Cruz. Like he was blonde and blue-eyed, um, and he was great. He was a great guy, um, and we dated for a long time. And there was a moment where um, some of my black friends, like my black guy friends, were sitting down with me, and they're like, so, but like, what are you doing, Jess? And I was like, well, is this an intervention? Like, what is going on? Um, and lo and behold, like, they had a problem with my dating a white man. And I was like, well, I don't understand what the problem is here. Like, what does it matter? Like, you know, we're, we're great, like, I love him, like, oh, my God, like, I thought I was going to marry him, all of these things. And so I had this tension with the black community um, that I already had with what I felt was this neglect from the older women of color when I got to St. Andrews, which was another, like, another adventure to try to navigate. Um, I think one of the biggest things that I struggled with was or some of the other things I struggled with in terms of visibility were, as I got older, what is my place as a woman of color in this community? Like, how how do I address my gender and race um, and how those two things intersect in my identity here? Um, because there wasn't too much of an avenue to explore these issues when you're sitting in a predominantly white classroom and they're just we aren't reading the kind of narratives that really reflect the tensions that I'm feeling. Um, and so... I was just really like kind of lost and didn't know who to talk to. And when I got close to the faculty member who was also a Latina and she was like really great for me. And I really realized that it was important to have older mentors at prep school and without people that kind of have more stability and an understanding of the culture, I think are, are really crucial like figures for students like myself and other students who I'm sure felt the same problems. Um, so my junior year, was or it actually was my senior year, uh, my friend Brandon and I were constantly plotting. Um, and we were like, you know what, before we graduate, and this was right after Tim Wise had come to speak at St. Andrews, and, uh, or it was announced that he was going to speak to us because we were on this diversity board. Um, and so Brandon and I were talking about, uh, well, what can we like do? What can be our legacy before we leave St. or after we leave St. Andrews? And so... Every Wednesday night, part of the prep school, or I went to an Episcopalian prep school, we had chapel. And so at chapel, faculty members would come and like speak for 20 minutes about some sort of like uh, social issue or whatever they feel passionate about. And that would happen and whatever. And so I said to Brandy, you know what, like we should have a chapel service and just talk about diversity at St. Andrews. And so um, we're thinking about like how provocative we can be. We're like, we have to say something offensive. Like that's really the only way for people to start talking. So we're trying to think of like all the crazy things that would make people uncomfortable, um, but like good uncomfortable. And so I was like, you know what we should talk about? We should talk about white privilege. And he was like, I don't know, Jess, like, I don't know if I want to deal with that. Um, and I was like, no, let's do it. So we had we handpicked a bunch of seniors who could speak from different perspectives. One of our friends was this kid from Maryland. Um, he was this white guy, Phil, who played lacrosse. He was a great guy, um, but there was we were trying to like represent different factions of life. And so he was like a lacrosse player. We had another girl. Um, I actually can't remember her. Um, and <laughs> she clearly didn't. But anyway, um, and so 
And so like every oh this other girl from Saudi Arabia she was a white girl from Saudi Saudi Arabia and she lived in a compound and so it was like wow that's like a totally different perspective and so um, so we covered socioeconomics and like uh, whatever athletics and so I get up there and I'm the last one and Brandon's looking over at me with this sneer he's like Jess I don't know if you want to do this so I get up from the podium and I'm like tonight I want to talk about white privilege and everyone just everyone's face drops and then they're like oh my god what is she about to say because st andrews is the entire type of environment where um you promote these kind of conversations about diversity but you never really push people out of their comfort zones you have these conversations to reassure people that they're doing the right thing and you're nodding along with them like yes you get it but there's still so much more to be pushed and so I was like, I'm going to push it. I'm going to push everyone. Like, I'm just going to do it. And so I give this speech about white privilege. And um, one of the things that Tim Wise uh, talks a lot about that I referenced was this idea of swimming in your privilege and not really recognizing, like, what that means. Like, fish in water don't know that they're in water. Um, and so, like, the sense of awareness of what privilege means for white people, what, what the implications and consequences are for people of color who can't identify with that. Um, and so after I give this speech, like, and I made this reference to my then ex-boyfriend, and they were like, oh, she talking about Zach. Like, she talking about that white boy. And I was like, no, it's okay, guys. And so there's some damage control. Um, but so in the next few days, like, people were in uproar. Like, I can't believe this. Like, I can't believe that people are blaming me because I'm white. Like, I didn't do anything. Like, I have black friends. Like, all of the kind of stereotypical things that you imagine a bad diversity conversation to have, like, that happened. And so, um, in many ways, like, uh, we had to, like, go on the defensive. So Brandon and I are over here trying to talk to people and say, you know, like, the point of these talks is to really push us out of our comfort zones and to make us uncomfortable so we realize, like, what we're just being apathetic about, what we're being complacent about. And complacency was a big theme at St. Andrews for me. Um, I felt to a certain extent a lot of my friends of color gave up on making St. Andrews a home for themselves. Um, and one thing that really stood out to me since I walked in into the dining hall, there's this huge mural when you first walk down from like this really grand foyer. Um, and it's a mural of all of the students who were like, and the founders, and the founders were like the DuPonts, and the DuPonts are like a really big family, um, and they still have a strong legacy at St. Andrews, but all of the faces were young white boys, and so when you walk into, and I said this in my speech senior year, when you walk into a space like that that's supposed to be where you have family-style meals and when you're supposed to come together as a community and you don't see yourself reflected in the very ideology of the institution, what are you supposed to do? And so for the next four years, you're just totally lost. And you're, you're trying to find yourself in this mirror, like, maybe I'm that little white boy. Like, maybe I'm that one. And, and at this, when you leave St. Andrews, it's this really mixed emotion of, I had a hard four years here with um, really trying to understand my identity and how that plays out in different environments. Um, but at the same time, like how much of this institution was mine and how much of the institution is remembering me and what I contributed. Um, and so that's a struggle I, st I think I still have at Williams too, um, because I think in many ways prep schools and institutions, liberal arts institutions function in the same um, in the same vein of, of thought and just the way that we try to I think in many ways um, incentivize these types of identities there's a particular identity you're supposed to have when you come to Williams and when you go to prep school you're supposed to play three sports you're supposed to be good at them um, if you're not then you know you're weight training you're doing something like there's something and there's some form of community that you can really engage with um, that makes everyone feel safe. And so once you start pushing those boundaries and start putting into question why people feel the need to hold so tight to these ideologies is when you see some of the foundations of these institutions really starting to, to fracture. Um, and so I think in some ways I still, I still wonder about what my contribution to St. Andrew's historical memory will be, um, just like I wonder what it will be like here. Um, and I think that that's something that a lot of students of color, especially from low socioeconomic status, feel. And I can't speak for all of them. Um, so yeah, that was my experience at St. Andrew's. Um, I'm still pushing all those things. And so that's my story.
I'll, I'll respond to those uh, stories really briefly, and then we'll turn it to the audience in case anybody wants to ask a question. We'll give you a moment <laughs> bleed. <laughs> to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so, the I, I um, it's very great to hear these stories, and I'll, I'll tell one little piece that I, I promised one of the kids in the film I would do. Um, and this is a reflection of the fact that all these, every kid's story is different. And when I tell my story, I, 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 I try and take the stand of, this is not the experience of every single black kid, it's the experience of, 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 my, of my, it's my experience rather. Uh, the one girl, Brie, in the film who's crying, Brie, she said, tell people that I'm okay. So Brie is okay. <laughs> she made me promise, promise to tell people that. Um, when she saw the film, she was really quiet, because she was still 16 at the time, now she's a junior in college. But when she saw it, she's really quiet, and I was like, so what do you think? And she's like, um, I have a pimple in that shot, can you? And I was like, you're a 16-year-old girl, awesome. Um, but it, it's really powerful for me to hear the diff three different tales, and also to see it verbalized in a, in a community. You know, someone came up to me and said, I wish that everyone in Williams could see this film tonight, because more folks need to see it, and I feel like it's the, the low-hanging fruit that are watching it. And I, I hear that, but I sometimes push back on that a little bit and say, you know what, sometimes we need to take care of you. You know, and we're in this space and we're verbalizing about it and we're moving forward and thinking about our legacies and our experiences. Um, one more little anecdote I'll, leave, I'll give. I'm not sure if you know this, Mr. Hickam, Hickambotham, but um, at Germantown Friends School, I don't know if it was, is, it was the judge your great-grandfather or? I think he's like my great-uncle or something great like uncle? that. Great-uncle? Well, he, he and his family, he and his wife tried really hard to actually get the first African-Americans at the GFS and they were turned down. Oh. Um, which is a trip, and Joan Countryman, and she ended up being the first uh, African American to matriculate the school and graduate. She went on. She was the head of Oprah's Aca Freedom Academy, um, and my eleventh grade calculus teacher. Um, but she was the first to. I mean, your your, your people tried, uh, you know, but <laughs> there were folks in place that didn't receive it. It was soon afterwards. So I, it's a funny thing. And also, I remember that night at Wilmington Friends so well because it was there were a bunch of boys that came in. From, from the wrestling team. Yeah, we um, practice. And if you get a chance, I just got an email from Darrell. Oh, Sini. Reach out to Darrell. The homeboy is at uh, North Dakota. North Dakota with 13,000 students there, 157 black students. Yeah, he's going through. Yeah. So reach out, to, reach out to Darrell. So with that said, if anybody would like to pose any questions, I think we have a little bit of time for that. The floor is yours. Or if not. Yes. Well, if nobody has any questions, I mean, I could, I could tell an, an anecdote. Well, let's, let's, hold on, hold on. I'm gonna, uh, it's good. It's, it's good, but I want to, let's try and get a response. <laughs> you had your hand up. Oh, yeah, I have a question. Um, so in the movie, um, you said that at that, there was a certain point we were embarrassed of your family. And it was that, like, Interaction that any interaction that you had between your two families, your white family that you called them, mm -hmm. and your black family, you told your white family that you loved them a lot, but I never heard you tell your mother or your father that you loved them. And so I wanted to know if you didn't say those words because you were embarrassed of them, and that embarrassment caused you not to love them. Like, where was the gap? Like, where did you start? Mm, yeah, that's a that's a that's a deep one. Um, I um, you know, it's. It was hard to make that movie and look at that stuff and see that because you're seeing what was reality and and part of my story and my mission and my like my ministry I guess you even say is to try and encourage people to be aware of those moments you know because I I, I was so deep you know that that scene where my mother's getting hair in the living room you know which got me in trouble a lot of black women but that's in there because when I was a kid I was outside like oh my god these people are so embarrassing can't believe them. And as an adult, I watch it and go, you know what? They are loving each other, fellowshipping, singing, hanging out. And I was outside of that. And my disconnection happened because of the shame that happened with the school. And I was also a different boy from them, but that's another story, sort of. But um, the disconnection did happen. And the not saying I love you, that was, that was a familial problem and situation that was related to, historically, people who came up from a a group that was just destroyed by economics and a legacy of slavery and inability to reach out and say I love you and be there because it just wasn't done in my house, you know, sadly. I was fortunate enough, I was fortunate enough to, to get that experience with my mother in the last year of her life. We talked about that a lot and said it constantly. You know, I even got it with my father. He, he passed away uh, December 2010 and the last month of his life I went, I went in to help him take care and we exchanged the love word which was incredible, you know. 
when I went in there into that scene with him, that was three hours of talking, and he, um, I think he was trying to his on his on his own way to show some love, because he just gave and gave. he didn't have to do that interview. He just gave and gave and gave and threw himself on the sword in lots of ways, and I had to pull apart and find the love moments. So you're you're seeing something that was very real, you know, in terms of and it's a problem. It was a problem, you know, and I'm giving that as a situation to help people hopefully do some internal searching. Go well, what? When, do I do that? What's my role in that? How do I inter interact with my family? Because, you know, love is, is deep and huge and important. And it's a sad thing to say, but a lot of the love that I did get from the Marbury's that was so outward and expressed that I didn't get from my family for various reasons that are very complicated was a bit of a saving grace. And that's a real rough moment. When I watch that scene, when I'm walking in, I'm like, Dad, you know, into, that, into the Marbury house, I'm like, gee whiz, you know, it's, it's heavy. So, you're picking up on moments that were really um, the very real that I was trying to use to illustrate this complex and complicated story. I didn't go through and, and make the happy ending and say, I tried to illustrate in that last scene my sister's making the change in the, in the, at, the, at the grave. You know, when she writes I, and instantly she changes it. That's straight, that's no cutting, yeah, that's straight through. And she wrote we, and it's a matter of like, when you get in, these, in those painful situations, it takes time to move forward. Um, and, and move on with that and change. So I love all of them, and we've said it. But you, you, it's real. It's very real in the movie. It's sad. It's heavy, but part of, this, part of the story is like, okay, let me give my story to hopefully heal other people and help them fix that situation before the last year of somebody's life or because it, it can change a lot in these two places and where they meet. Uh, why were you... Uh the shape in a sense of your parents' jobs? Um, I was, I was a, that's a, a super one. I was ashamed of my parents' jobs because um, I went, I, going into that school, to reflect back on some of the stories Jessica is talking about, when you walk in that environment, it's so intense. You know, when I went to my school, Ethan Allen's grandkids were, I was like, Ethan Allen's a real person? You know, I thought it was just a, a brand. His grandkids were in my school. A woman who's, whose grandfather invented the paper bag was in my class. And I was like, wow, there's, brown, there's bread and there's the brown paper bag and that's your grandfather. So I came in and I was surrounded by this intense wealth. And my situation was exaggerated because my mother worked in a factory and the factory owner's son was in my class. And I'm 14 and I didn't know how to deal with that. And I didn't have, I didn't, sadly, I didn't have anyone at home saying, doesn't matter where you come from, you are great and wonderful and powerful. I had like, be careful of those people. And if, if, I, if I did bad on a test, are you gonna fail out? You know, because they, they didn't understand the environment. So I didn't have any support, you know, at home, which was, which was major. Um, and, and I think my, my shame just came from, I went into the school and I thought, okay, to be successful, I need to be like them and forget everything I know. You know, which I've seen, heard a lot of people say and do, and I'm like, wait a minute. Slow down, slow your roll, because I think that that is something to really pull apart. Class in our society is huge, and we don't talk about it. It's hard to talk about and to discuss. So that shame, just, it, was just, it was a mixture of a, an adolescent kid trying to figure things out. It was a mixture of not having a strong foundation you know, to sort of ground me and say, hold up, you know, where you come from is wonderful and powerful and dynamic. And in my, in my individual experience, it was exaggerated with that factory Experience. I have. Other, I had other friends in school who said I didn't face the shame that you talked about around class and the like. You want to call us Marcella. It's for the students. Do you think the prep school really prepared you to come to to college to Williams? Do you know how to navigate in the first day and come and converse with the students who go to? Um, I actually find myself talking about this all the time recently as I think about leaving Williams. Um, I think that going to prep school definitely positioned me as a person of color to be able to navigate a lot of different communities a lot more fluidly than some of my other peers in the people of color community. Um, part of that also comes from 
coming in as a, a volleyball recruit. And so like I had a team to come to. And so I automatically had a community to, and I didn't have to choose like, am I going to be Hispanic? Am I going to be black? Like first and foremost, like I can throw my hands up and say, well, I'm in season. I don't have time. And so like that was cool for me in the sense that socially I was more savvy of the environment I was in. And this was in many ways a do over of, of high school. Um, which is a very catch-22 because I think that in some ways you try to avoid some of the pitfalls that you made in prep school um, in terms of the kinds of relationships you form. But I definitely think like socially, academically, I've been really well prepared to navigate class discussion. And there are so many like of those those hot button words like, you know, unpack and like what's at stake and all of those things that I learned in high school that I use all the time. And I'm like, oh, like all of those Williams <laughs> teacher, all of my half of the English department at St. Andrews is from Williams. And so I was like, that's why they say this all the time. <laughs> um, and so I was like, well, what's at stake here is and my classmates were like, oh, who taught you that? Like, what does that mean? Um, and so it was just a lot of like just those little buzzwords and the language and the rhetoric was so accessible to me with my white peers and with my white teammates. Um, but that was also really complicated. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would definitely say, I think that's uh, in terms of college and being prepared for college and all of the, uh, the, the circumstances that come associated with it, you know, lots of free time, uh, lots, of, <laughs> lots of food, right? But I think uh, going, to, going to boarding school really, really just makes it just, uh, just the smooth, I, I, for me at least, the smooth a, tr as tr a transition as could possibly be. I, mean, I, I, I was excited to go to college. I mean, I don't have to, you know, lights out isn't at 10 p.m. anymore. Mm -hmm. I could be in my, be outside my dorm, whatever. I mean, I could, I don't know, the girls could be in your room without having three, what, three feet on the, uh, the three, floor. yeah, that three feet on the floor or whatever. Yeah, I mean, uh, all those silly boarding school rules are removed now. <laughs> And it's like now we're just all, you know, here. I mean, so I think, yeah, I'd definitely say boarding school uh, really makes college transition a breeze. Um, yeah, so I didn't go to boarding school. So, like, for me, the only real, like, advantage I would say was just, like, being different. Like, I didn't have to deal with that. And I, um, and I, and I can say that, at least in Delaware, like, a lot of the public schools, like, they're comprised of, like, the same kind of people. So like because of the way like the districts are set up, it's weird. But um, so like I know some of my friends who went off to college that are more white than than their high schools. Like they had that culture shock that I had back in like ninth grade. So like I, it's just like I already went through it, so I don't have to go through it again. I know how to navigate it now, and I also had a team to come to, two teams in fact. So like. Um, you know, it's just like people who, who were instantly like my friends, at least my friends, if not like good friends, to just to be around, so. Yeah, Kadir. Um, there's a question for uh, Mr. Lee. Um, there was a, I was just disconnect that you felt with your family, you know, just in contrast, your sister going to public school, you going to private school. Um, sort of looking back now, do you think you did enough or you find ways to sort of, I guess, limit that disconnect and sort of get closer to, you know, maybe some of your sister's classmates in public school who were misinformed or didn't have the opportunity to experience what you experienced. Like, how did you sort of spread your knowledge and your experience to them? Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's funny. I think about my sister Robin in the movie, and I, I think about our different experiences and the choices we both made in our lives. and. I always I giggle to myself and say she could have never gone to Germantown French School because she would have burned us to the ground. You know, it was not a place for her. Um, and that, because when it comes to private school, I, you have to figure out what school works for a child and where they can fit in. Um, and in terms of how I have gone back and given um, back to the community, I guess you could say, and communicated my some ideas, you know, I had, I had to find a way to, I had to go back in and not be so pompous when I went back in. You know, not, not walk in like, oh, this is how this is going to work. And I know I had to really go and it's a life skill to really learn to meet people and assume they have the same intellectual capacity as you and start right there, you know. And, you know, I made a film to deal with all this stuff. And I've been seeing some of her friends and her, 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 our friends, people we grew up with, come in and see it and thinking like, okay, are they going to get it? And they, they completely get it, you know? And even, I've even had some people say like, you might love you more than you thought, you know, and, and get all in my case, and it's, it's good to hear, you know? So, 
So I think my, my like ways of reaching back to them have been on individual levels and just being present, you know, and being aware and, and checking myself. This, I did this up a long time ago, you know, because I, I became aware of it soon after college of like, what's, why am I so distant? What's going on? Um, but I've, been, I've, been, I've used the film as a tool also to bring folks in to have some of the conversation. Because um, I think a lot of people assumed I didn't want to be around or I wasn't connected and I wasn't a part of it. And we both were outside looking in and making judgments without coming together uh, first to make the movement. Um, some of you went to boarding schools and some of you went to day schools. Which of, which of those experiences is harder? Is it harder the total immersion of a boarding school or the dipping back and forth every day? Um, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm just going to say that it's different. Um, you know, the total immersion thing, I can't speak to it, but I can say that, you know, going back and forth leaves you feeling without a home sometimes because, you know, your friends from home, you don't really fit in. Your friends at school, you don't really fit in. And, like, you know, um, there were times where me and my family didn't always get along because of whatever reason, products that didn't fit in at either of my communities, and I was being like a catalyst for destruction. Um, so like, I can say that, you know, maybe it's not harder, maybe it might be harder to be at a, at a boarding school, but it's certainly just like a different type of difficulty where, where like, you know, at a boarding school, I'm, I don't know, you want to speak about it? I'm um, yeah, I mean, I guess for my for my specific school, I mean, when I went there, I mean, uh, uh, fifth grade, I mean, they, uh, I had like I had a host family. Uh, I think I had two. I had two host families and then like an alternate one. So I mean, uh, you know, whenever I like wanted something or whatever, I needed something or some clothes, so, you know, I just call, hey, what's up? Like I need this. You know, th th you know, they just got it for me. And um, so I mean, I think I think I definitely would have had a. A worse experience if I if I hadn't if I if I had to go back and forth. I mean, I think uh, I just I don't think that I was uh, strong enough really to be able to handle that sort of uh, that transition. You know, from day to night to day to night. I mean, it was it was really difficult. I remember even going home on breaks. Like, ah, oh, darn! I've got to go back to you know Brockton. Like, this is gonna suck. And I remember one time I uh, I, I said dude to uh, you know to a bunch of my friends from Brockton. You know, and they were like. What the what the fuck did you just call us? And I was like, oh, sorry, my, so I forgot about that. Um, I mean, I'll say briefly. I think that what could be difficult about boarding school in comparison to prep school um, is just that the transitions are so jarring when you go from school to home, like during breaks, um, and so. During summer break, for example, none of your friends from school are around for three months um, because they're so geographically spread out. And so as you get older, you appreciate those relationships more. But I mean, they're kind of hard to maintain. Um, and so that, I would say, is probably one of the biggest differences I've noticed. Oh, I, I would echo that and say that, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's different. And as I, as I travel the country and visit boarding schools and day schools, there are very similar stories, but they're also very different stories. And it's and to to do a versus is a difficult moment because I don't want to quantify the experiences to make one worse or better. But I think it, it, the best word is that it is different. And the, what you also describe is a phrase that we've coined that I think I mentioned earlier is uh, psychological homelessness. You know, because it's like where I mean that moment of that, think about that moment of I don't want to go home because it's going to suck. Like that's. That's huge. Or when you go back to your friends and you talk differently, and you go back to school and it's like, well, what'd you do over break? And it's like, well, you know, everybody's <laughs> very tanned from, even though it was February, you know, it's a trip. Sure. Well, first I'd like to say thank you for making this movie, being a boarding school student myself. I can reflect a lot of the experiences and emotions and stuff like that. But I have a question for all of you at least. Uh, how was it when you experienced mixing in both worlds, uh, your home world and your school world, if you were a boarding student, like graduation, like high school graduation? Was there something, like did you have to juggle a lot in that moment or did you not even have to deal with it? This is for myself, it was something where everything just went to an extreme more so than it normally was. Well, I remember graduation was particularly tough because um, you get kicked out of your dorm by like 5 p.m. 
And so you have to move everything out. And it's also the same time that we leave for like senior parties. And so um, for people unfamiliar, like senior parties are usually, and I'm sure, I don't know, but um, like for us, it would mean we would spend a week starting from like the moment you're done graduating, like just going up and down like the East Coast, which is pretty pretentious, um, like partying at people's houses. Um, for like a week before you all go your separate ways and never see each other again. And so it's like this big deal like, oh, what senior party to get invited to, blah, blah, blah. And so for me, the problem was um, I was torn between like celebrating this moment and like saying thank you to my family for like supporting me and like being there and like just wanting to go because I knew this was the last like week I would have with so many of my classmates. And so that was a direct conflict for me in choosing like, which is my priority right now? Is it like my new life with St. Andrews? Or is it like going back and, and giving thanks to my family, um, even though they didn't have much access at all to my experience? And so it was just, it was, looking back on it, it, it really troubles me in terms of like how I treated that day, because I was so antsy to go. I was like, I just want to go, like, I want to go with my friends, I want to get in the car and like, you know, be a high school senior for a few more days. Uh, yeah, I guess for me, uh, at at some point, uh, uh, you know, I just reached a, a time where I just, uh, I, don't, I guess I'll just call it, you know, fully assimilated. Um, and I think I just didn't uh, associate, uh, you know, anything positive really with my home friends. I mean, I think, uh, you know, like in Brockton, I mean, you know, a, a lot of the friends, kids that I used to be friends with, you know, they just, they just weren't ambitious. Um, they didn't really have uh, any sort of future that was aligned with the future that I wanted for myself. It'd be like my friends at school, you know, were gonna get excited about, you know, going to Exeter, Deerfield, Choate, et cetera. You know, my friends from home were just, I don't know, like not excited about anything, but you know, I don't know, go to like do criminal activities. So it wasn't a, it wasn't a, a, a big, uh, you know, juggling act for me after a certain time. Um, for me, uh, I played three sports in high school, and you know, in Delaware, there's no separation between the prep schools and public schools. Like we could all play each other. So, like, you know, my family was very integrated with the school because they had two kids there, and like, I don't know, I think my mom wants to make sure I'm okay all the time. So she ended up getting involved with like a lot of school activities. But the real clash came when like I had to play them, and like it very, it very much became like me versus you, and, like me and my friends versus like my other friends and 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 when like when we played each other football basketball lacrosse like you know if we beat them you know they hated me but like if i lost like you know they got to gloat and everything was okay so like it just became hard like especially when like through sports and like in the middle of the season like competing for playoff spots like you know we beat your team so we're going to the playoffs and you're not like you know, the clash there was that it was hard for me to separate, like, my home friends from competitors, and it was hard for them too, I guess, but, like, you know, it was only during the summers where, like, it was very easy to be friends because we weren't competing, so, you don't know. Graduation was great. <laughs> I mean, I think. I mean, I think you know. Um, there's there's a book. Uh, Why are all the black kids sitting together in the cafeteria? I, mean, I read that book, and um, I, mean, I think uh, you know. There's a lot of analysis, a lot of theories about why that happens. But I mean, I think you know, basically, and I think this is also universally ap applicable. I mean, people just want to be around their friends, you know, as, as much as they can. I mean, if their friends happen to be black, happen to be white, happen to be rich, poor, whatever, I mean, then they're just going to be around them. I mean, uh, and for me specifically, I mean, in middle school, we had we had assigned seating, so there was no, <laughs> there wasn't any, there wasn't any, uh, there was no none of that. <laughs> um, I can I can see both sides how it can be destructive, but also community building. 
I know in high school there was one. I sat there sometimes, but not all the time. And you know, if, and here as well, you know, you can feel as if it's like building a community within like people who look like you, like you can relate to on like certain levels that like you can't share with everyone else. But also like if you're n like not like active into getting into that community or like fostered into that community, like you can look at it like, whoa, like. I'm not like I'm not welcome there. Like, you know, I'm not really friends with any of you guys, and I and, and and like you know, I feel like I should be there, but I'm not, and I'm gonna go sit over here, and like I know here there's no real pressure or anything like we saw in the movie, but um, like it certainly can feel as if you know you're left out or like you're not where you should be because like you're like well, I look like them, shouldn't I be with them? Or, like you know what I mean? So like. I mean, yes, it is community building, but it can also like be destructive at the same time. I think um, one of the biggest problems with the black table um, was always just the visibility of how uncomfortable black students at the table were um, in terms of them not necessarily feeling, at St. Andrews in particular, um, the students that did, my first few years, it was a totally different dynamic, but the first few years where I was at St. Andrews, the black table was one of the most intimidating things I've ever seen. Like, they were constantly just like laughing at someone. And so for like the younger kids of color, we were like, well, damn, like what's wrong today? And so it was like scary. And there was just this very, it, it came off as very, it came off as threatening in many ways for some of the younger kids of color, especially like the women. And so we didn't really know what the black table meant when we first got there. Like, all right, well, do you get an invite? Like, am I black enough? Like, what should I do? And so um, on that end, it was hard. But in terms of trying to figure that out, when I had conversations with some of my white classmates, um, the problem that I constantly felt was that there was a problem, there was an inconsistency in access and like what parts of the community, um, the general community could claim. And so the problem would be, well, some of my white friends didn't feel comfortable approaching the table and so it was a problem. And it was like, well, what really is the problem here? Is it really that the black kids don't feel comfortable here or is it that you don't want to extend yourself? Like where is the common ground? And so there was a lot of conflict over like, what kinds of kids sat at the black table. Um, it was usually like non-athlete black kids from like New York or New Jersey that were sitting at the table. And so they were already the kids that felt super ostracized by the community and didn't really feel like, not only do they not see themselves on the mural, but they don't see themselves in like the curriculum in the focuses of the institution. Um, and so we started asking, a bunch of us that were really interested in diversity issues were like, well, why don't we talk about all the white tables? Like, there's a room full of white tables and a room full with one black table. So what's really, really going on here? And it's this issue of perspective. And I think that that was really challenged a lot um, by the kids of color that were able to navigate both the white and black communities, um, but not necessarily by everyone else. And I'll jump on and echo that last point you made. And I want to say a few more points because I'm older. Um, the, the, sometimes my, my position, I didn't know I was sitting at the black table until someone said you're sitting at the black table. You know, I thought I was just having lunch, you know, and I think sometimes that's really all it is. And we can talk about all the dynamics and how deep it is and this and that and response. And sometimes like, you know, you walk in a room, you see somebody, you know, or people you do know, and you go over and yes, you're pointing out some of the, some of the social dynamics that happen at those tables. Those things happen at all the other tables also, but because it's such a visual moment, they're, they're exaggerated. You know, I always say to people, if during lacrosse season, the guys or the girls put the, the sticks on the back of the chairs and you walk in the room, there's a lacrosse table. If I go, they're gonna throw a ball at me. You know, we, we, we do all that stuff because our minds go to, that moment for, even as an adult walking with the, when the, in the cafeteria, I had it today and we were walking with my tray. I was like, where do I sit? You know, that continues and so, it's, I, I, I often, because I've heard people say like, why do the black kids segregate themselves? And I'm like, that's a really big word to put on an experience that may just be lunch. And even, I even push back a little bit and say, we're community building. You're like, before you make it this movement, you know, sometimes you're just sitting and having lunch and relating to people. And it is so important, especially in an environment, environment like a Williams College, a Connecticut College, St. Andrews, et cetera, et cetera, 
you have to find places where your aesthetic is appreciated and celebrated. And that's why we go towards groups where we're like, I don't feel strange and weird, or no one's going to touch my hair. And if someone asks about the texture <laughs> of my hair, it's actually a real question about the texture, not an outside observation. So, so and I, I, you made a, a lovely point that I really like in terms of uh, for asking a person who's observing the black table to examine themselves and say, why don't I feel comfortable going over there? Because that's, that's, that's the moment, you know, on, on all sides. That's the moment to look inside. And then the little pieces that I'll push back on, um, a statement you made, Aaron, um, that, uh, I'm sorry, yeah. my bad, um, <laughs> Mr. Higginbotham, uh, <laughs> that it's not a problem here. I'm willing to bet money that there may be three or four or five or six or 10 people that it probably is a problem here for that don't talk about it, that may be going through what Bree is going through, but don't ver verbalize it, because who wants to come forward and come out with that? You know, and then um, Daryl, and I say this with love, because I had to deal with this too, I'm willing to bet money there are at least five or six to 10 to 20, or some people in Brockton that are about something, you know. And I don't think you're saying that completely, but I, wanna, I want us to think about how we um, look at our communities in general and be aware of our thoughts and our actions and ideas. So I wanted to say that, because that's, that's one of the main points of this movie, because I was on that, I was in the same perspective of like, oh, what's up, Lane? I'm out, I'm done, it's, you know, what is it? You know, not, that's not an attack. That's coming yeah, right. from love to, to make sure you examine that thought and that way of thinking um, a little, just a little bit. I don't, I've been to Brockton. I know people <laughs> there, so I know what you're talking about. But I also say it's important for us to, um, you know, that's one of the messages of this, of this project is to examine, because if we, if we can't see the joy and the beauty of where we come from and have pride in that um, and take it out, into the universes we go into, um, and you all are leaders. I need you all um, to take on and, and run this world. And let me tell you, you're gonna experience that same thing getting kicked out in a minute, because you're a senior, right? Mm -hmm. mm, you just wait. Yeah, you know. <laughs> it's gonna be intense. Um, so with that, you know, I, I, I think we probably need to close out, but thank you all so much for coming out tonight. And um, I, feel, I thought this was amazing, and I wanna give a round of applause for you all. <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank you.